Please turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew. For the next uh, number of weeks, we will be looking at the Lord's Prayer uh, together. It has been my desire for a while to do a, a short series on, uh, on prayer. Um, and I wanted to do that before we go to the Song of Solomon, which is the next project, as it were. Um, after this, while well, we take a break from John's Gospel. But the Lord's Prayer is rich with teaching about prayer. And you can tell a lot. Um, I, I'm sure I've heard it said, you can tell a lot about a person uh, by their prayer. And prayer is something that is very, very simple and very, very mysterious at the same time. <laughs> and uh, it sounds like God in many respects. <laughs> the Trinity in one way is very, very simple. There is one God and He exists in three persons. What's wrong with that? And, but when you start to think about it, mm, actually, <laughs> it blows any mind. And prayer is a little bit like that, unsurprisingly. It is communication with this awesome God. Um, that is what the heart of it is, prayer. And my hope and prayer is that as we will con uh, look together into these verses, we will be thoroughly inspired to pray. And maybe correct some bad practices we all suffer from, which our Lord Jesus will pick up on but so that we can pray better, individually as well as, as a fellowship. Now, this bit of prayer that the Lord Jesus teaches here focuses on private prayer. But I will keep emphasizing, this does not mean that the Lord Jesus taught that only in private must we pray. Not at all. He is teaching about prayer by saying an open, a public prayer. <laughs> But the focus, as we look into this together, is very much on the personal prayer of the believer. And so, uh, without further ado, let's go to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5. And I will read to verse 15. This morning we will be considering verses 5 and 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins, will not forgive your sins. So reads the Word of God. Let me just briefly pray. Father God, we need your help to understand these verses and to you we turn. Lord, you tell us that if any of us lack wisdom we should ask and you will give and so here we are please would you impart your wisdom 
to us so that we can pray in a way that pleases you. Amen. Amen. So this is the question that Jesus is addressing in this, uh, in this part of the scripture. And this part that I've just read is right at the heart of what uh, is sometimes called the Sermon on the Mount. Bang in the middle, as it were, Jesus is teaching about prayer. And not just about prayer, because this in turn, this teaching about prayer, is part of a smaller section within the Sermon on the Mount, which we could perhaps uh, term as piety, or living in this world as a Christian. And in that part, which begins in chapter 6, actually, in verse 1, he teaches about giving to the needy, he teaches about prayer, and he teaches about fasting. And there is a key verse that we have to keep our minds, uh, in our minds I should say, all the while we are thinking about prayer as well as giving to the needy and fasting. And it's verse 1. This is, if you like, his lead verse into this for our Lord Jesus. He says here, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And it's that sentence that Jesus then applies to giving to the needy and to prayer and to fasting. And two things we can see from that. First of all is that God cares about righteousness. In fact, the most important <clears throat> verse perhaps in the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5.20, where Jesus says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The people he calls out there, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, law were the religious elite at the time. So if anybody wanted to know what a true religious or Israelite person is, one who truly worships God, they would think of these men, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And now Jesus is saying, don't take for granted that they will get to heaven. In fact, I'm telling you something else. Unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness that is theirs, you will most certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Why is that? Because at the core of Pharisaic teaching by this time, which is not Old Testament teaching, but that was what they taught, was that you've got to do certain things and then God will be pleased with you. As long as you do the external things right, well, that's what matters. And Jesus is saying that is all a load of rubbish. Your righteousness needs to surpass that. God is not going to be bribed by your good works. No, the Old Testament, in fact, tells us God looks at the heart. That is what God looks at. The Lord looks at the heart. It's people who look at the outside of appearance and we are blown away when we see something good or amazing. God will not be fooled. He looks at the heart. And so Jesus says, God cares about righteousness of the heart. Doing right is not enough. Wanting to do what is right. Desiring to do what is right because you love God. That's what God is looking for. God cares about righteousness. But also, we can see here in this first verse, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them, is that God also cares about how we practice our righteousness. In other words, it's not good to say, well, I love God, and he knows that, and that's it. No, Jesus is teaching, be careful on how you practice your righteousness. What we do also matters. But because we are creatures of extreme, we either go full on on this side or full on on that side. And actually what Jesus is saying, both matter. Both matter. It matters whether your heart is God's. And it matters how you live if you claim that your heart is God's. And so, it matters 
how we pray. It matters a great deal how we pray. And the first thing we learn about prayer in the verses that we are going to look at today is that we are to pray to our unseen Father. If I could summarize uh, today's message with the one sentence, when you pray, pray to God, which you might think, well, that is obvious, is it not? It is obvious. But by our practice, we can actually be caught out, perhaps with our words praying to God, but in reality, praying to other people around us. And that is what the hypocrites did. So, Jesus' first teaching in verse 5 is that we should not pray to pe for people to see us. That's what the hypocrites do. When you pray, Jesus says, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. A hypocrite is actually a term that comes from uh, acting. A hypocrite is an actor. So, um, if you were an actor in uh, Greek times, the way you expressed sadness or happiness is by putting a different face in front of your face. And so you came to the scene, you know, when you are about to die, and I don't know, in these things, people die for 10 minutes uh, for some reason, and they sing about it for 10 minutes as well. Maybe I'm confusing genre here, but you get what I mean. But what you would do, all the while you were sad, is you put a sad face on. Or if you uh, happened to be in another scene, and you ha had to be very happy, then all you did was you changed the face. And now you're happy, and everybody sees you're happy. This, this, there's nothing wrong with this. This is acting. The problem is, Jesus says, there are people who treat prayer like this sort of acting as well. The hypocrites. He says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love, they take their, uh, their Greek um, acting play into the street corners, where there happen to be lots of people, busy street corners. Or they take it to the synagogue, where there will be most definitely lots of people. And when it comes to prayer, they stand up so they are seen by the people, and then they pray to be seen by people. So their words may be addressed to God, but in reality, they are praying to people. They are praying to the audience. They are playing to the audience. Jesus says, don't be like them. Don't seek people's admiring gaze. The problem is not that they are praying in public. As I said, Jesus is about to do the same. The problem is not with that, that they are in the street corners or that they are in the synagogues. Pray wherever you are. <laughs> if you're in public, you pray in public. If you are, you know, the public nature is not the problem. Neither is the problem that they are praying, even though they are hypocrites. You see, there is this strange way of thinking. Well, if I prayed now, well, I would be hypocritical because I don't feel like it. So I'm not going to pray. But their problem is not that they are praying, even though they are hypocrites. You see, God welcomes, welcomes the prayer of a repentant sinner. Jesus tells this story about this Pharisee and the tax, tax collector. And the tax collector, beating his chest, would not even look to heaven. And he said, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says he walked away justified. God welcomes the prayer of sinners. And so even if you don't feel like it, <laughs> Don't think, therefore, I'm not going to pray because it would be hypocritical. Or my, my, my life is so messed up, I can't possibly come to God in prayer like that. That would be hypocritical. No, you most definitely must come to God when things are like that. That's a trick of Satan to keep you away from your God. The problem is not that they pray even though they are hypocrites. The problem is with the how they pray. They pray, play, pray, playing to the audience. And so I got thinking. 
So I got thinking, in what ways can this be a temptation for a believer to pray like the hypocrite? I don't want to pray like that. I don't want to pray to be seen by others, but I also know my heart. <laughs> and I know I can be tempted. In what ways? Well, I've thought of five brief ways that this can be a problem. But maybe we could think of more. This can be a problem if we are only play, praying in public. You know, like a professional sort of thing. Or you feel bullied into praying even though you never pray at home. You make sure you pray in public. That can be one t temptation. Or, of course, we can try and impress others with our eloquence when we pray. This made me think of the IKEA showrooms. Now, uh, IKEA, I know, uh, is like Marmite. You love it or you hate it. I belong to the I love it bit. And it's awesome, because you go to IKEA and you totally get lost, because you go through this showroom. And what is the showroom filled with? Homes. Awesome. Homes, beautifully decorated with the furnitures that, you, with the furniture, sorry, bad English, yes, with the furniture and you look at this house which is so beautifully furnished and you think, oh, I could live in this. And then you go in because you want to be a bit closer to this and you go and you, there is a bedroom and there is a bed there, beautifully laid. I'm sure all our beds look like that all the time. Beautifully laid, 15 pillows, three uh, glorious duvets on top. And you just say, oh, I could sleep in this. And then you go to the bathroom and there is a beautifully tiled bathroom. And you go in and, oh, and then you look down and you see the loo and it's all covered up. And then you realize, oh, it's a fake home. I can't live in this. I couldn't sleep in this bed. I couldn't use this bathroom. It's not a real home. It's all a show. Now, in that case, it's all fine. That's what it's there for. But when we dress up our prayers for the sake of it, we can do the exact same thing to impress people around us how awesome we can pray. Or because, you know, things always have a flip side. Another way we can be tempted is, oh, no, I'm not going to impress anyone with my eloquence in prayer I'll be so natural and simple I'm going to be so myself in this prayer that when people hear it they will say well yes isn't that a different kind of prayer and that's just the other side of the coin we are just trying to impress people not with eloquence in that case but with simplicity or with natural language whatever it is and then we can be the person we can call the convincer you know we've all done this uh, well I have probably you know when you fold your hands shut your eyes start talking to God and all of a sudden you think of all the th people around you and all the messages that have bubbled up in your head that you should have told these people so now you're going to and you pray to God telling to God things about him that you think other people around you should know yeah, that's not good either, <laughs> is it? We're not really praying, is it? We are just craving for a platform and we can't have one, so nobody will interrupt our prayer. That can be a form of it as well. Or we can have the private here. Because of all these dangers of public prayer, I will never pray in public. I will just make sure that I say my prayers. And so don't worry, I, at home I always say my prayers. This made me think of this quote from a certain person called Garnall. I'm not sure who he is. I'm sorry, but I found this in a book, and it's great. He calls this sort of prayer like the hen who goes into a secret place to lay her egg, but by her cackling tells all the house where she is and what she is doing. If I could have a pound for, a per uh, for every person whom I've talked to, and I ask them, do you know God? Or do you have a relationship with God or anything like that? And I say, well, I'm not sure. But I say my prayers. I would be a very rich person. We want to impress people with our prayers 
one way or another, I found five ways in, in my brain that, you know, that, that I have come across that can be temptations. Maybe we can think of others. The common denominator of these is this. When we pray, we must make sure that we do not pray to people who we see. Because there is a danger in this. Jesus says, truly I tell you. So when he says that, it's worth listening. Anytime Jesus says anything. But it's like really important. He says, truly I tell you, in verse 5, they have received their reward in full. It's people's clap they want. People's clap they will have. But that is all they will have. This people's admiration is what they want. That is what they will have. It can work. We can impress people with our prayers, however we go about it. But if we succeed, and even if we don't, our reward is precisely that. God is unimpressed, unmoved. And I do not want that. And Jesus is teaching when we pray, we who believe in him, we who love him and call upon his name, we should not pray like that. Much rather than praying to people we see, we should pray to the Father we don't see. See, this is what Jesus comes to say in the positive uh, part of this, uh, this couplet of two verses. He says, but when you pray in verse 6, and this is emphatic in the Greek, when you pray, this is how they pray, but when you pray, Jesus says, Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is in secret, will reward you. When you pray, pray to your Father whom you cannot see. What Jesus is in effect saying here, instead of chasing people's admiring gaze, much rather you should seek your loving Father's face. You should pray. We should pray like a child of God. Have you noticed how God is consistently called Father all throughout this prayer? Which actually presupposes something. It presupposes that God is your Father. And so maybe this is where you first need to stop and think. Do I pray to God as my Father? Do I know Him as my Father? The reason Jesus came to this world is not simply to teach about prayer or to teach about anything. He did came, come to do that. The first and number one reason He came is that so we can know God as our Father. Because our sins separate us from Him. And many, many things we do draw this to our attention all the sins we do all the ways we mess up it highlights there's something wrong with the world and there's something wrong with us and the way to get right with God is not by trying to address those things individually but to own up and say God I am a sinner I am like that tax collector who went and would not even look to you beat his chest and I just say God be merciful to me a sinner that is the first step you may need to take this morning do you know God as your father if you don't it is utterly pointless for you to learn how to pray utterly pointless you will have no audience with him until you are made right with him unless you pray this prayer God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God will not be impressed. <laughs> He's the most impressing being there is. He will not be impressed. We need to be born again. We need to be brought into his family. And you can know that through Jesus, who lived a perfect life, who died on the cross to pay for your sins and my sins. And the moment you put your trust in Him, God's Spirit will come live in you and you will be a child of God and you can address Him as our Father. 
our Father? So this is the first question. Are you a child of God? Well, if you are, this is for you. And here are three lessons from verse 6 on how to pray. Now we see how not to pray, like the hypocrite. We can think about that. Now let's see how are we to pray to our God and Father. We are to pray, first of all, in private. He tells us, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Now, it's about the third time I say in this sermon alone. Jesus is not against public prayer. This is not about that. (laughs) No, rather, much rather, we have a contrast with verse 5. In contrast to verse 5, where you see these actors, you are finding yourself in this busy theater in which the actor is the prayer, and then everybody is watching in and is amazed, or appalled, or whatever, but something is happening. You are transported from the theater to the only room. (laughs) You can possibly lock in your home this inner room that Jesus is speaking about. You almost get the sense that this person is fleeing from that and rushing to his room and shuts himself in and bolts it up and pulls the sofa there and uh, I don't know what else you can do to secure the door so you are not disturbed. Why? Because this person is driven by a desire to pray to someone who can't see him. Uh, Sorry, whom he can't see, but who can see him nonetheless. He is rushing in so that he can be with his father. And he does this, we get the sense, regularly. Because Jesus doesn't say, if you pray. He says, when you pray. When you pray. Whenever you pray. Whenever you happen to be. Just go and do this. Make it happen. As Jay Vaughan says, take with you fatherly views of God. A father likes to hear everything. He never refuses a secret. Beautiful words. This is a person who knows that and rushes into his inner room and makes sure his appointment with God, his heavenly father, is met. Oh, it's amazing, this privilege that we can have. Talk to this great God. So do you keep your appointment, my brother? Do you keep your appointment, my sister, with your heavenly Father? When you wake up in the morning or before you put your head down on your pillow at night or any time in between, do you have your regular appointment with your heavenly Father? He's there waiting for you in your inner room to hear from you. That should blow your mind as well. (laughs) Why does God want to hear from us but He sees what is done in secret. His eyes are on us. His ears are on us. And he is listening. We don't need to amaze people around us. <laughs> we have a God who loves us. Anyway. And so we pray in private. We make sure we are in communion with our God. Not only in private, but we pray in faith. This is an unseen father. Father. An unseen father. You will not have visions granted to you. You will not have an encounter in Jesus in the flesh when you go into your inner room. But you will have a real encounter with God. Do you believe this? It's a prayer of faith. You see, in Hebrews 11, 6 we read, Without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists. And he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So it's a private prayer. It's a very deep and personal prayer. It's a prayer of faith. And it's a prayer to be rewarded. Jesus finishes this sentence, by, uh, this verse by saying, Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And my brother, my sister, pray to be rewarded. Pray to be rewarded. Pray to be rewarded, first of all, with God. This is what Abraham heard. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. This is the same God you are praying to. Pray that you will know intimate, deep fellowship with Him. That you will enjoy Him. Pray to be rewarded 
with God. The psalmist says, you, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. You are my ultimate satisfaction. Pray to be rewarded with God. Pray to be rewarded by God. If any of you seeks wisdom, he will get it. Solomon needed wisdom. He prayed to God for wisdom and he got it. Do you need anything to, to, to live for God in this world? What will God withhold you that will help you towards that? Where will you find that help? In your inner room with God. So how are we to pray? We are not to be like the hypocrites. We don't need to impress anyone. My brother, my sister, God is your father who wants to hear from you. So go and pray to him as a child of God and delight in his presence and ask whatever is on your heart and may he grant you all that you need to live for him in this world. Amen. So let's now uh, sing our final hymn, number four, four, five. Oh, praise ye the Lord, praise him in the height, rejoice in his word, ye angels of light. Ye heavens adore him by whom ye were made, and worship before him in brightness arrayed. Let's close with this song of worship to our God, to our Father. Let's stand and sing.